All right. Well, welcome to the Wednesday Witness, a skill building series. Thanks, James. James is our senior communication specialist and has been helping us out always with tech today. So, so grateful for you. Um, and I'm so grateful for my colleague who's also here with us today to talk about advocating uh, through visiting. Um, we're going to I'm going to formally introduce you, Reverend uh, Henderson Edwards, a little bit later. I'm going to do some housekeeping at the top first, but I do want to just say, go ahead and introduce yourselves in the chat as you have been doing. Welcome, Julie, Brenda, Andy, Carlito at Africa University, Mutare, Zimbabwe. Welcome, welcome. We are so grateful for each and every single one of you who is on the call and who's on their way. So I'm Reverend Laura kigueba James. My pronouns are she, her. I serve as the director of grassroots organizing at the general board of church and society of the United Methodist Church. And I'm joining you all uh, today from uh, the United Methodist building located on the traditional and ancestral homelands of the Anacostans and Nacogdoche Tank peoples known as Washington, D.C. And I welcome you, we welcome you to the Wednesday Witness Skill Building Series. So this series was created for you all as United Methodists to build your capacity and knowledge to advocate for justice with your decision makers. This is a four part series. I can't believe we are in part three. We have one more to go. Uh, I'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, but in this series, we use the Church and Society Civic Engagement Toolkit uh, to do a deep dive into organizing and advocacy tactics for social change. So each session will include a training, followed up by a small group breakout session that I hope you all stay for, uh, where you can practice and share with other United Methodists who are ready to create social change. So just a few things to be aware of during these sessions. This session content will be recorded and available on the Church and Society YouTube page for later viewing. However, our question and answer, breakout time and discussions will not be recorded. So the training uh, will be recorded uh, but everything after the question, answer, breakout time and discussions will not be recorded. So there are a few of us on the call uh, just for the flow of conversation, especially for the training part. Just please stay muted uh, unless you have a question uh, or you just want to share your experience. So just raise your hand and I'll invite you in so that we can engage in that dialogue. If you have questions or suggestions or need further support with any of the materials shared here today uh, during the series, uh, please just email me at lkjames at umcjustice.org. So go ahead and email me at lkjames at umcjustice.org. So in March, um, we talked about advocate through calling. That was a long time ago and it's May. So in the March series, we learned about how calling your decision makers creates change by making a direct connection from you as a constituent and as a constituent who's a member of your own community that you represent to the decision maker and the policy that you're, at, you're advocating for. So when you call uh, as a member of your community, you are making a personal and impactful connection. So I just want to stop and kind of pause. Was anyone in the March session and did anyone make a call? And if you do, like, please share. What was that experience like? So I'm just gonna, I know some people have called their members of Congress uh, or decision makers. Christina, I see you on the call. So I may call you out, but did anyone have you, were you able to contact a, a member of Congress by phone at all? I didn't contact any of my members of Congress, but in our last General Assembly here in the Commonwealth of Kentucky, I did have several meetings with our um, state reps Awesome. and state senators. Awesome, that's it. And I apologize, thanks for correcting me. This is about decision makers. So whether that's at the local, state or federal level, as long as you did something, right? This is skill building. We're not just here to talk, we're also here to engage. So thank you. Is that tip? I'm just reading your name. Is that correct tip? Okay, awesome. Anyone else? 
My name is Carol Johnson. I have called before, but unfortunately, all I do is leave messages. They never take my calls. Okay. All right. That's fine. But you made the call. Uh, thanks, Carol. Um, so yeah, we're going to talk a little bit about follow-up because uh, that happened to me and we're, I'm going to share a little bit of um, my experience as well. Uh, so thank you all for just um, living into that. Uh, you know, we want to make sure that we are truly practicing what we're preaching in these sessions. So I'm glad that you took the chance and you, you did it. So thank you, Tip, and thank you, Carol. Awesome. Awesome. So today we're going to be spending the next few minutes learning how to move from calling to now setting up in-person visits with your U.S. members of Congress or hopefully your decision makers. So I know that there are a few folks um, outside of the U.S. Carlito, welcome. And we also want to hear from you and about how you connect with your decision makers, even when you're at the university. Um, maybe it's connecting with your dean um, on different student policies that need to be changed, right? Um, so we want to make sure that in this conversation that we can kind of share and benefit from the collective wisdom in the room. Uh, you know, we have this gift of collective wisdom because we're a connectional church and we flourish when we share our ministries, ex ministry experiences from various contexts. So for those who are joining today outside of the U.S. or advocating at different levels with your decision makers, local, federal, um, please jump in and share your experiences and share your knowledge for the good of all of us. Thank you, thank you. So just as an overview for our time today, uh, we're gonna do a discussion. Uh, uh, you know, typically I kind of have slides, but since we are talking about the tangible of sitting with your decision maker, whether that is in a congressional office with your state legislature or uh, a local community member, we're gonna have a conversation uh, with my colleague, uh, Reverend Henderson Edwards, uh, and hopefully can kind of tease some of those pieces out. Then we'll move to question and answer, We'll have some time and breakouts and then we will close. Awesome. Okay. So I am very, and can I say just very excited that today's training portion of Wednesday Witness uh, will be in conversation, like I shared earlier, with my incredible colleague, Reverend Camille Henderson Edwards. We welcome you, Rep. Reverend Henderson Edwards, uh, so grateful uh, to share this virtual space with you. Uh, so for everyone's uh, just information, um, so we are going to be following uh, just so this can be just a helpful frame, uh, the one page, one pager on setting up uh, your in-person visits um, with your decision makers. And I believe that should be in the chat. Uh, and this one pager comes from the Church and Society Civic Engagement Toolkit. So the dialogue that we have today is going to follow that kind of step by step. So you can kind of get a sense of um, how to do it when you uh, prepare, uh, hopefully in the next few weeks. Okay. So Reverend Henderson Edwards, um, I call you and, you know, this is just me personally, I call you the goat. Okay. So for those of you who don't know that what that is, a goat is short for the greatest of all time. When it comes to setting up visits on Capitol Hill, uh, this year alone, you have set up more than 42 visits on top of your incredible ministry that you're leading here and beyond your work at Church and Society. And so I really wanted to just have a chance to sit down with you and talk more more about your process and setting up those calls and visits uh, and also kind of sharing any lessons uh, really gained uh, and how those lessons can inform us as United Methodists who are preparing to set up our own visits. But first, before we jump into the technical, can you just share a little bit more about yourself and how you came to this work of faith-based advocacy? Yes. Well, thank you, uh, Reverend James, for having me today. And hello to everyone who uh, is gathered here in this space. It's so great to see you all. Um, to your initial question, so how I came into this space, I, I believe that uh, from the early days of discerning my call, there has always been this call to the intersection of religion and government. Um, I am a uh, currently provisional elder in the North Georgia Conference Annual Conference of the United Methodist Church. Um, and I see my call as bringing um, the 
the spirit of congregational ministry into the public square. So creating community um, and making sure that we are uh, analyzing this intersection of how we show up within the religious space. Um, and then also the what implications uh, how our presence, uh, what implications our presence has for our advocacy. Um, and so I have served in the local church setting uh, for the past few years um, at Cascade United Methodist Church in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, and then uh, took an appointment here as the Director of Economic Health and Gender Justice at Church and Society. Uh, and so I've been in this role for about a year now. Um, time has flown by and it has been a time. We've been having a really great time. Um, so, so yeah, that's how, that's how I got here. That's how I got here. Awesome. Welcome. Welcome. It Time has flown by. Mm -hmm. And thank you for naming about this connection between congregational life and the relationship between the public square. And so I think that's a really helpful frame um, as we're talking about what it looks like to set up in-person visits. So what prompted uh, the 42 calls uh, at the beginning of this congressional session? And um, is that issue still relevant for this moment? Yeah, so um, the context uh, of what was happening, um, as I'm sure you all know, currently in the United States, um, Congress is working, uh, is in the midst of several debates about the debt ceiling. Um, so several months ago, it was announced uh, that the United States would reach its limit to pay its bills. Um, and so, uh, either the debt ceiling has to be raised or what's currently being debated, um, cert certain spending measures have to be adjusted in order for the United States to pay its bills. What we learned um, some months ago was that several proposals were being made um, to cut critical social safety programming in order for the U.S. to pay its bills. Mm -hmm. um, this highlighted, so the cuts were around three areas of food, so hunger, um, housing, affordable housing, and uh, health um, and uh, access to Medicaid. Um, because those programs benefit, have been proven to benefit uh, those who need the resources most. We wanted to make sure that we were sending a message to our representatives, uh, letting them know that this, was, this wasn't where we wanted to go. We wanted to make sure that uh, everyone has what they need when they need it. Uh, and so as debates around the debt ceiling progressed, uh, we began, and so when I say me, um, church and society, uh, the other directors, we work with partnering coalitions, whether in the DC area, um, you know, or or beyond. Uh, but there is a specific coalition, the Washington Interreligious Staff Coalition here in DC, that is made up of um, organizations representing faith communities. Um, and a working group within that was the Domestic Human Needs Working Group. Um, so this was a, a large group of us that came together to say that we wanted to begin having conversations uh, with certain members of Congress. Um, as that relates specifically to church and society, uh, what you have seen hopefully in an action alert that has been sent out and what you will continue to see is the campaign that we are calling Grace Over Greed, uh, that we as United Methodists must prioritize grace. Um, that is a central tenet of our faith and our theology. Um, and part of, so as we look at bringing congregational life into the public square um, or extending congregational life into the public square. Um, if we are to understand grace uh, in a, a, as that thing that is readily available, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that, that, that you don't have to work to, to, to um, be a benefactor, right? That, that you don't have to do these things to receive the grace of God. Um, we want to communicate that, that there are certain things such as being able to feed yourself, mm -hmm. right? Being able to uh, have shelter, being able to have access to proper medical care that we want to make sure uh, 
uh, that we're prioritizing. Mm -hmm. um, and so both in that campaign of Grace Over Greed from Church and Society, and then the work that we're doing uh, as an extension of that with our coalition partners, um, that's the context uh, of us reaching out to these members of Congress. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you for that. And thank you for uplifting that just dropped today, actually, just a few hours ago, the Grace Over Greed Action Alert um, and upcoming campaign. And so when you we move into small groups, you'll really have time to review that and really kind of assess how you'll be speaking uh, to your decision makers, um, specifically when it comes to the U.S. Congress. I think there will be some opportunities on the local level to even to make the same ask, uh, because a lot of things are happening at the state level when it comes to cuts to an implementation. Um, and so, uh, but that will be up for you all in terms of your own discernment, right, around how that language is used, but it's all still relevant. Um, so thank you for naming that. So, so let's kind of jump into the technical side of having these conversations. So the first point, at least within the one pager, is to make an appointment in advance. Let's specify advance. Yeah. <laughs> um, so specifically, you call the office to schedule a time to meet, inform them of the issue. And the issue that we're framing is grace over greed. So affirming that there are basic needs as food, medical care, um, as well as just uh, overall protections uh, that, that shouldn't necessarily have a qualifier for, right? Um, that this should uh, just um, be because we are human, right? Mm -hmm. And this comes out of our own welfare and care. Um, so how in the process of making those 42 calls, how did you identify the right office to call? Uh, and who did you ask for uh, when you made those initial calls to set up your in-person uh, visits? Yeah, so for the for the 42 offices that we reached out to within the coalition, we identified those offices uh, because we knew that these would be members uh, that were sort of like on that moderate, uh, on the fence about uh, voting a particular way um, mm -hmm. for certain spending. And so we wanted to identify these 42 members where we knew we had somewhat of a chance in saying that this is a need and we wanna make sure that that need is satisfied even as debates about the debt ceiling um, progress. Mm -hmm. uh, so because we had that in mind, we identified the 42. Mm -hmm. um, the next step after that was to reach out. So I reached out, I sent an email um, for me, I uh, contacted uh, either um, office managers, chiefs of staff, uh, or legislative assistants that I was familiar with. I think for um, general um, occasions that you were hoping to set meetings up, either reaching out to the scheduler, uh, if there's an office manager, those types of positions. Um, if you go on the member's website or the representative's website um, to look for those people who who would have uh, say over um, a meeting calendar for the office. Okay. Okay. So would you say, because when we did the call last time, uh, could, can you also just call if you reached out to the congressional switchboard and just asked to speak to an office manager, right? To set up yeah. this call. call. Great, 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 great. So just wanna, yeah, I think it's kind of different, you know, for us in the national office, cause we have like, we build those relationships, but then for mm -hmm. folks who you're on the local level, you are the constituents. I think it's, you kind of have, um, I would say even a level up in the set sometimes because there's some offices that are like, oh, you're from the national level. No, we want to talk to constituents depending on the season that um, it's in. And so just for you all who are listening, just to make sure that like, yeah, make those calls. Like, and um, when you are making those calls, and I think Christina dropped in the chat, uh, they do record when their constituents call in on specific issues. So um, establishing those relationships and putting yourself out there is also um, important. And then the other thing I wanted to kind of name around making, um, you know, setting up these appointments in advance uh, is like some, our expectations, right? Around sometimes we expect to speak to someone, get that meeting right away, but sometimes we have to call more than once. Can you kind of share uh, your experience in having to, yeah, sometimes um, be a little bit more persistent in making sure those meetings happen? Yeah, so I I first want to highlight though something that you said about relationships. I think that it is very 
important to keep in mind that we are still in relational work um, and that any uh, interaction that you have with your uh, offices uh, or representatives, you are beginning a journey of building a particular relationship or a particular rapport, right, with who you're hoping to get in contact with. Um, and so calling, following up in, on email, tweeting, be, you know, all of these things are, are how we sort of enter into conversation. So building a relationship, I think, in, in a, in a long-term frame is something to keep in mind. Um, in terms of being persistent, so, so for me, when I sent initial emails, not everyone responded, right? Sent out 42, may have had 10 offices to confirm, 15 people were out of the office, you know? And so there are a bunch of things. I think also it's important to keep in mind that we are not the only ones uh, or only uh, constituents or, or people that that person in that office is interfacing with. Mm -hmm. uh, and so just the volume of people alone uh, that staffers receive, I think, is 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 extremely high. And so just on that premise of perhaps they are receiving uh, a high volume of phone calls or high volume of emails is something to keep in mind. Um, I had to follow up multiple times, uh, right? And so that is the standard, that, that's the norm and something to be expected uh, that sending an email or picking up the phone to call a single time is great. Again, introduction to starting the relationship um, and then following up again and again and again and again um, until you build that rapport. Persistence, I believe, is the name of the game. Um, and diversifying the ways that you reach out to uh, the people that you're hoping to connect with. Mm -hmm. Thank you for naming that. Definitely. Whether sometimes it's a call, it's an email, but the good thing is you will hear back. You will hear yeah. back. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. So then the next step is being prepared. And you kind of spoke to this, um, that you, all, you along with the WIS community, Washington Interreligious uh, Staffing uh, Council Coalition, uh, that you all did some homework beforehand, right? Mm -hmm. um, in terms of knowing who to call and this importance of taking the time to learn about your official, uh, who you're meeting with and what, um, and what they're thinking about, um, even before you get to, um, arranging the meeting and like being in person uh, in the conversation. So just curious about once you confirm the meeting, what are the next steps that you took to prepare? Um, were there other people from um, who else was in the room with you? Uh, and also how did you decide about who, who and when, right? You would um, speak with, uh, whether it was a staff or a member of Congress, um, when it came to the information that you were sharing. So kind of, um, yeah, what was that kind of uh, preparation to really set up that in-person meeting uh, well? Yeah, so I think the first thing, and because we were hoping to address a particular issue, one of the first things that we looked at were, what are the congressional committees that this member is sitting on, right? Mm -hmm. So we know that because, you know, structurally certain members have their focus on certain things based on the committees that they sit on. Uh, so we wanted to do our homework about what committees the member uh, sat on or were assigned to. Are there, were there particular areas of interest for that member that they may have expressed maybe in their voting, uh, maybe in press releases that the office, you know, maybe released uh, in previous times, uh, but what were the members looking at and what were their priorities? Mm -hmm. um, we also wanted to make sure, so, and, and I think that that you all will find this, that um, we wanted to diversify the type of information that we were providing, right? Narratives in terms of what's happening on the ground has an extremely profound effect, right? On a person's ability to understand what's happening, mm -hmm. right? But we wanted to pair that with, um, like concrete data, right? So what are, what are the statistics uh, specifically within that district of who is unhoused, right? 
uh, how many people are uh, 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 going without food, right? Who or how many people, what demographics um, are, are, are being restricted in terms of access to, to healthcare, right? So what are the statistics, what's happening on the ground narrative wise? And then also what are the statistics that help to paint a picture of what's going on? Um, and I think that we made the decision to decide like to, to assign who would speak on a particular issue based on their own lived experience, right? So there are people, uh, for my like myself, for example, who I was, I am quite versed, right, in being able to talk about things like SNAP um, and uh, social safety programs around hunger and poverty. Uh, and so I took that on as uh, something to talk about in the meetings because I was knowledgeable about it and would be able to provide um, additional data, right? So you want to make sure either that the person has particular narrative about the topic. Uh, and then you want to make sure that you follow that up with research um, at, from, you know, reputable, uh, credible sources, right, around how that is being collected, uh, the data that's being collected within that particular district. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you say more about credible? What, um, about what resources uh, that you, yeah, that would be helpful. I think, I will name for us in terms yeah. of the research that we do uh, at Church and Society and gathering, um, uh, I think in relationship to our social principles and bringing that and naming that up in that office is very helpful. Um, but, but what else would you offer? Yeah, so I usually look for uh, sources that have been viewed by others, like other entities outside of themselves. Uh, and so usually if you are doing research on a, a social issue, um, then they will either, you know, know that um, if they've gone through a process of peer reviewing or things of that nature. Um, I'm also, so I am like resisting going into sort of like the academic mind of, so if we look at academic journals, right, then there's a problem. <laughs> but, but I think primarily, right, uh, looking at um, uh, if uh, a source uh, has been reviewed and is received by its peers um, as a credible source, right? So for example, mm -hmm. Um, major news sources, right? We know that uh, go through this process of vetting information and confirming information. And so if you are to pull an article from like the New York Times, right? We know that it has this reputation of being vetted and rarely are they going to provide information that has not been uh, verified. Mm -hmm. um, so, so just in general, sort of like those things, uh, sources that have avenues for verifying information outside of their, you know, their own context. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. Thank you so much for naming that. And just as a resource um, in this conversation, you know, I have been uh, in meetings before where we've left our church and society faith and fact cards and mm -hmm. um, decision makers have been like, oh, wait, this is what the United Methodist Church says. Yeah. Uh, and, and we have like what, uh, yeah, what scripture says, what the church says, uh, and then just facts and um, that those resources come from whether that's the United Nations, CDC, um, depending on the over 30 plus issues that we cover. And so, uh, and those, all of this um, faith and fact cards are available on our website. Uh, and so as you consider and reflect on when you're going to set up your meetings and what resources that you want to leave behind. Those faith and fact cards can also be really helpful as well. Yeah. So thank you so much for naming that. So we, uh, we've scheduled our meetings. We're prepared in terms of education. Now, timeliness and flexibility. Yeah. Uh, and so, and, and I think there's this other reality because um, whether it's a member of Congress, your state legislature, and even the local office, um, you know, we are still navigating both with precaution and care, like the present and aftermath realities of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And so there is this, there is so much that we don't know about arranging meetings with um, our decision makers and if they are meeting in person and how they will receive us if there's security, traffic. Um, and so can you just speak to why is it 
important to be on time and flexible. And if you can give any examples of how timeliness and flexibility have served you uh, during um, in-person visits. Yeah, yeah. Well, in general, I would like to say part of my HBCU upbringing taught me that to be five minutes early is to be on time. <laughs> okay. And so I, I generally start with that framework of always being five minutes early because that is the point at which you are on time. Uh, but but then also, um, especially, you know, I'm observing within uh, uh, the federal level that there are so many things that change, you know, in a moment, right? And so one, we want to make sure that we are honoring the time that either staffers or members have carved out to be able to interface with us. Um, and so we want to show respect in that regard. Um, but then also, um, I think it's important to, to show up uh, in my own experiences of doing in-person visits, you know, practically, if you are going to set up several meetings, you're walking around, okay, it's hot outside, <laughs> you don't know where you're going. So I think it's important that if you have a meeting, say at three o'clock, to aim to arrive by 245, the mm -hmm. buildings are large. Um, and you want to make sure that you are settled, right, in body and in spirit. I think that it's also important um, and very common for people to gather outside of the members' offices to sort of do a quick huddle, right, mm -hmm. to check in, make sure everyone's there, um, to make sure that you have your talking points and to make sure that you have any material that you hope to leave behind in hand, uh, because the overall interaction does happen pretty quickly. I think staff members are accustomed to this flow of introducing yourselves, exchanging business cards, having a conversation, and then they almost anticipate uh, to receive material that you are hoping to leave behind. Uh, and so just to make sure that you are prepared uh, physically, that you have the materials that you need um, arrive early, uh, but then also uh, in the event that a member uh, does have to change their schedule, uh, you want to make sure that you um, are, are there to at least have initial conversations, even if they have to cut the meeting short, which mm -hmm. does happen often. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. Thank you for that. And so in relationship to timeliness and flexibility in, in the midst of that meeting, it's important to there's this importance to stay focused and friendly. Yeah. Uh, and so one, once the meeting begins, um, you know, I, I think in the introduction, sometimes we can lose track. Uh, and so uh, kind of like you said, you know, being respectful both of your time and, and the time of uh, your member of Congress. Um, but just really curious around what are some best practices um, in listening and being friendly in an office that does not hold the same views on a particular issue that you do? Uh, and how do you navigate opposing views uh, even as the meeting begins and as you start to share what uh, you are advocating for uh, and yeah, the office doesn't agree? Yeah, one, I think it's important, you know, as we uh, talked about earlier that you are still, uh, building a relationship with another person, right, with another human being. And, and so I think that there is a level of dignity there that, that must be maintained simply off, you know, on the premise of the fact that these are just human beings having a conversation with other human beings, right? And so to keep that in mind, um, there have been instances where I have walked into offices and knew before I was walking in that they would not agree uh, with what we were hoping to advocate for. Um, and in those times, I think one, uh, that to, uh, there are times where we must uh, speak truth to power. And sometimes, right, we must, like part of advocacy is naming things that people uh, are choosing to look beyond, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so there is um, a commitment on, on our end to be able to say in this 
tense moment, right? When they are just mean mugging and there's no smile and there's just no movement, right? Mm -hmm. That these are things that we are experiencing and we're hoping to do something about it, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that there is a way to have that conversation because you are talking with another human being where you don't have to raise your voice, where you don't have to uh, do things in a hostile way, but simply naming what is happening, I think is the first step. Mm -hmm. um, and then also I'll say that in addition to what it is that you're saying, numbers are very, very important in terms of who shows up. Mm -hmm. uh, so even if it is uh, you going in to name a thing, the fact that you are coming with other people who are standing behind you or standing with you shows that office that there are multiple people outside of yourself who also care about this issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and there are, you know, you are, are a constituent uh, within the office that they represent. Mm -hmm. uh, and so numbers uh, equate to uh, priority as well. When people come in, and I think that's why we do a lot of work within the context of our coalitions, because we go into the offices to say that we are representing not just ourselves, but all of these other organizations that care deeply about this particular issue. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that when you come in uh, offices, even if it is something that they traditionally don't agree with, um, they are somewhat forced to at least take note that multiple people care about this issue. Uh, and, and hopefully the intent is uh, to reconsider right, their stance on a particular topic. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for naming that. Uh, and I think that's something that I've kind of said over and over again, is that we don't do this work of advocacy by ourselves. Like it's in solidarity, both with those who we're advocating with, um, but also the our congregations, our districts, our annual conference. Um, yeah, numbers do matter. Um, and, and I think that kind of ties back into something you were naming earlier around like relationship that yes, we're making relationship with the decision maker we're communicating with, um, but also considering who, who else are we doing this work of creating social change with. So yeah. thank you so much for naming that. So the meeting is coming to a close. Uh, we have done the work uh, mm -hmm. and the last stage is to say thank you, debrief and follow up. So can you just kind of briefly offer just the best practices around following up with your decision maker? Um, what would you offer? Yeah, so definitely, as we've shared before, right, making sure that you have credible material to leave behind uh, so that they can reflect further on what has been discussed. Um, if and, and I, I'm starting to realize that people don't normally do this, right? So if if within the context of conversation, right, they ask a question, and that has been uh, my experience in some of the meetings that we've been having, uh, we would make mention of, of something that was happening in the district, and they didn't know, and they genuinely ask for more information. And people say, oh, yeah, I'll get back to you. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people don't get back. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think that what is important uh, is to make note in the meeting of of where the conversation, you know, what what you are talking about within the course of the conversation. And if there are actual follow up items that staffers or members have mentioned, they would like to receive more information on mm -hmm. and to follow up with that, follow through with the information that you say that you will provide. Um, I think the quicker uh, you follow up, the better. Uh, so you have a meeting at 10 a.m. towards the course of uh, the end of day or close of business sometime before 5 p.m. to send a follow-up email either with that information or just to uh, recognize uh, that you appreciate uh, the time that they have spent with you. And if there is a way for you to serve or be of assistance in any way that you would be happy to do so. Um, so I think follow through one in the conversation, whatever comes out of that conversation, uh, and then also time and making sure that you are just sending a an email, um, sometimes even written material. I think sometimes we we uh, lose the practice, right, of handwritten notes. Um, just saying, you know, uh, showing your gratitude for the time that has uh, that was spent, um, and then offering your assistance for any future partnerships or future needs uh, within that district. 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Handwritten notes matter. And yeah. I know it always puts a smile on my face when I receive hand- handwritten notes too at our office. So just, just to say that, put that plug in. Mm-hmm. Oh, Reverend Henderson Edwards, thank you so much. You truly are the GOAT, the greatest of all time uh, when it comes to, to um, both making these visits and living into your call. Thank you so much uh, for really uh, sharing with us what brings you to the work of church and society. And I'm just so grateful to be in ministry with you uh, and for your sharing uh, and your continued um, advocacy. Uh, uh, so so thank you. Thank you. Um, so as a reminder, the resources that uh, Reverend Henderson Edwards and myself moved through in our conversation today is directly from our civic engagement toolkit. So literally, we talk through step by step of how to set up your in-person meeting, uh, as well as giving you a little bit more guidance and insight uh, to best practices of maybe when you don't hear back, or uh, maybe if the conversation gets hard, uh, to continue to stay hopeful and remember that this is an opportunity to build relationship, right? Justice uh, in in the terms of scripture, right? It, it it is always about right relationship. Like when we talk about justice, we're really talking about how can we be in right relationship with one another uh, and being able to have an opportunity uh, to create that right relationship uh, with decision makers is powerful, it's impactful, and it is a step towards social change. So again, thank you. Um, Just know that we do provide advocacy trainings at Church and Society, whether you're in DC um, or uh, maybe you're not in you need support of how to set that up at a local level, we're happy uh, to support you in that. And you can email me at lkjames at umcjustice.org, as well as um, I believe just our general email at gbcs at umcjustice.org. Uh, Reverend Henderson Edwards, do you also want to drop uh, your email in the chat or just say it out loud so people can know how to get in contact with you? Yeah, I can do both. So I will drop it in the chat. And my email is ch edwards at umcjustice.org. Yeah, yes. Thank you. Thank you. So as a reminder, today's session is being recorded. It will be available later on our YouTube page. Uh, Today's session is the third of fourth and our next and unfortunately final for this season uh, will be uh, Wednesday, June 7th, right around annual conference season, uh, advocating through public witness, advocating through public witness. Uh, How do we do that uh, using our voice in the public square? Uh, uh, And so please, uh, the registration will come out shortly for that. Uh, So, and just to say more, this session will identify best practices for setting up a public witness in your community or outside of your decision maker's office. Uh, So just if you're looking more to find out more about the Wednesday witness, uh, there shall be a link in the chat about that. And as well, the Grace Over Greed uh, campaign has started. Uh, We do encourage you to read through that language, begin calling as well as setting up meetings with uh, your decision makers uh, so that we can truly, truly advocate for human flourishing uh, rather than greed.